Greetings esteemed viewers, and welcome to Tailingo, the channel dedicated to enhancing your English language proficiency through the art of storytelling. You'll learn English through story. Tailingo was created with the aim of making English learning both highly effective and enjoyable. If you're looking to reach the peak of English proficiency through entertaining stories and novels, don't forget to subscribe Tailingo and press bell icon. The Golden Bird A certain king had a beautiful garden, and in the garden stood a tree which bore golden apples. These apples were always counted, and about the time when they began to grow ripe it was found that every night one of them was gone. The king became very angry at this, and ordered the gardener to keep watch all night under the tree. The gardener set his eldest son to watch, but about twelve o'clock he fell asleep, and in the morning another of the apples was missing. Then the second son was ordered to watch, and at midnight he too fell asleep, and in the morning another apple was gone. Then the third son offered to keep watch, but the gardener at first would not let him, for fear some harm should come to him. However, at last he consented, and the young man laid himself under the tree to watch. As the clock struck twelve he heard a rustling noise in the air, and a bird came flying that was of pure gold and as it was snapping at one of the apples with its beak, the gardener's son jumped up and shot an arrow at it. But the arrow did the bird no harm, only it dropped a golden feather from its tail, and then flew away. The golden feather was brought to the king in the morning, and all the council was called together. Everyone agreed that it was worth more than all the wealth of the kingdom, but the king said, One feather is of no use to me, I must have the whole bird. Then the gardener's eldest son set out and thought to find the golden bird very easily, and when he had gone but a little way, he came to a wood, and by the side of the wood he saw a fox sitting, so he took his bow and made ready to shoot at it. Then the fox said, Do not shoot me, for I will give you good counsel. I know what your business is, and that you want to find the golden bird. You will reach a village in the evening, and when you get there, you will see two inns opposite to each other one of which is very pleasant and beautiful to look at, go not in there, but rest for the night in the other, though it may appear to you to be very poor and mean. But the son thought to himself, what can such a beast as this know about the matter? So he shot his arrow at the fox, but he missed it, and it set up its tail above its back and ran into the wood. Then he went his way, and in the evening came to the village where the two inns were, and in one of these were people singing, and dancing, and feasting but the other looked very dirty and poor. I should be very silly, said he, if I went to that shabby house and left this charming place. So he went into the smart house and ate and drank at his ease and forgot the bird and his country too. Time passed on, and as the eldest son did not come back and no tidings were heard of him, the second son set out and the same thing happened to him. He met the fox, who gave him the good advice. But when he came to the two inns, his eldest brother was standing at the window where the merrymaking was, and called to him to come in. And he could not withstand the temptation, but went in, and forgot the golden bird and his country in the same manner. Time passed on again, and the youngest son too wished to set out into the wide world to seek for the golden bird. But his father would not listen to it for a long while, for he was very fond of his son and was afraid that some ill luck might happen to him also, and prevent his coming back. However, at last it was agreed he should go, for he would not rest at home, and as he came to the wood, he met the fox, and heard the same good counsel. But he was thankful to the fox, and did not attempt his life as his brothers had done, so the fox said, Sit upon my tail, and you will travel faster. So he sat down, and the fox began to run, and away they went over stock and stone so quick that their hair whistled in the wind. When they came to the village, the son followed the fox's counsel, and without looking about him went to the shabby inn and rested there all night at his ease. In the morning came the fox again and met him as he was beginning his journey, and said, Go straight forward, till you come to a castle, before which lie a whole troop of soldiers fast asleep and snoring. Take no notice of them, but go into the castle and pass on and on till you come to a room where the golden bird sits in a wooden cage, close by it stands a beautiful golden cage. 
But do not try to take the bird out of the shabby cage and put it into the handsome one, otherwise you will. Repent it. Then the fox stretched out his tail again, and the young man sat himself down, and away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled in the wind. Before the castle gate all was as the fox had said, so the sun went in and found the chamber where the golden bird hung in a wooden cage, and below stood the golden cage, and the three golden apples that had been lost were lying close by it. Then thought he to himself, It will be a very droll thing to bring away such a fine bird in this shabby cage. So he opened the door and took hold of it and put it into the golden cage. But the bird set up such a loud scream that all the soldiers awoke, and they took him prisoner and carried him before the king. The next morning the court sat to judge him, and when all was heard, it sentenced him to die, unless he should bring the king the golden horse which could run as swiftly as the wind, and if he did this, he was to have the golden bird given him for his own. So he set out once more on his journey, sighing, and in great despair, when on a sudden his friend the fox met him, and said, You see now what has happened on account of your not listening to my counsel. I will still, however, tell you how to find the golden horse, if you will do as I bid you. You must go straight until you come to the castle where the horse stands in his stall. By his side will lie the groom fast asleep and snoring. Take away the horse quietly, but be sure to put the old leathern saddle upon him, and not the golden one that is close by it. Then the sun sat down on the fox's tail, and away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled in the wind. All went right and the groom lay snoring with his hand upon the golden saddle. But when the son looked at the horse, he thought it a great pity to put the leathern saddle upon it. I will give him the good one, said he. I am sure he deserves it. As he took up the golden saddle, the groom awoke and cried out so loud that all the guards ran in and took him prisoner, and in the morning he was again brought before the court to be judged, and was sentenced to die. But it was agreed that if he could bring thither the beautiful princess, he should live, and have the bird and the horse given him for his own. Then he went his way very sorrowful. But the old fox came and said, Why did not you listen to me? If you had, you would have carried away both the bird and the horse, yet will I once more give you counsel. Go straight on, and in the evening you will arrive at a castle. At twelve o'clock at night the princess goes to the bathing house. Go up to her and give her a kiss, and she will let you lead her away. But take care you do not suffer her to go, and take leave of her father and mother. Then the fox stretched out his tail, and so away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled again. As they came to the castle, all was as the fox had said, and at twelve o'clock the young man met the princess going to the bath and gave her the kiss, and she agreed to run away with him but begged with many tears that he would let her take leave of her father. At first he refused, but she wept still more and more, and fell at his feet, till at last he consented. But the moment she came to her father's house the guards awoke and he was taken prisoner again. Then he was brought before the king, and the king said, You shall never have my daughter unless in eight days you dig away the hill that stops the view from my window. Now this hill was so big that the whole world could not take it away. And when he had worked for seven days, and had done very little, the fox came and said, Lie down and go to sleep, I will work for you. And in the morning he awoke and the hill was gone. So he went merrily to the king, and told him that now that it was removed he must give him the princess. Then the king was obliged to keep his word, and away went the young man and the princess. And the fox came and said to him, We will have all three, the princess, the horse, and the bird. Ah, said the young man, that would be a great thing, but how can you contrive it? If you will only listen, said the fox, it can be done. When you come to the king, and he asks for the beautiful princess, you must say, Here she is. Then he will be very joyful, and you will mount the golden horse that they are to give you, and put out your hand to take leave of them, but shake hands with the princess last. Then lift her quickly onto the horse behind you clap your spurs to his side, and gallop away as fast as you can. All went right, then the fox said, When you come to the castle where the bird is, I will stay with the princess at the door, and you will ride in and speak to the king, 
and when he sees that it is the right horse, he will bring out the bird. But you must sit still, and say that you want to look at it, to see whether it is the true golden bird, and when you get it into your hand, ride away. This, too, happened as the fox said. They carried off the bird, the princess mounted again, and they rode on to a great wood. Then the fox came, and said, Pray kill me, and cut off my head and my feet. But the young man refused to do it. So the fox said, I will at any rate give you good counsel. Beware of two things. Ransom no one from the gallows, and sit down by the side of no river. Then away he went. Well, thought the young man, it is no hard matter to keep that advice. He rode on with the princess, till at last he came to the village where he had left his two brothers. And there he heard a great noise and uproar, and when he asked what was the matter, the people said, Two men are going to be hanged. As he came nearer, he saw that the two men were his brothers, who had turned robbers. So he said, Cannot they in any way be saved? But the people said no, unless he would bestow all his money upon the rascals and by their liberty. Then he did not stay to think about the matter, but paid what was asked, and his brothers were given up, and went on with him towards their home. And as they came to the wood where the fox first met them, it was so cool and pleasant that the two brothers said, let us sit down by the side of the river, and rest a while, to eat and drink. So he said yes, and forgot the fox's counsel, and sat down on the side of the river, and while he suspected nothing, they came behind, and threw him down the bank, and took the princess, the horse, and the bird, and went home to the king their master, and said, All this have we won by our labor. Then there was great rejoicing made, but the horse would not eat, the bird would not sing, and the princess wept. The youngest son fell to the bottom of the river's bed, luckily it was nearly dry, but his bones were almost broken, and the bank was so steep that he could find no way to get out. Then the old fox came once more, and scolded him for not following his advice, otherwise no evil would have befallen him. Yet, said he, I cannot leave you here, so lay hold of my tail and hold fast. Then he pulled him out of the river, and said to him, as he got upon the bank, your brothers have set watch to kill you, if they find you in the kingdom. So he dressed himself as a poor man, and came secretly to the king's court, and was scarcely within the doors when the horse began to eat, and the bird to sing, and the princess left off weeping. Then he went to the king, and told him all his brother's roguery, and they were seized and punished, and he had the princess given to him again and after the king's death he was heir to his kingdom. A long while after, he went to walk one day in the wood, and the old fox met him, and besought him with tears in his eyes to kill him, and cut off his head and feet. And at last he did so, and in a moment the fox was changed into a man, and turned out to be the brother of the princess, who had been lost a great many, many years. Hans and Luck Some men are born to good luck, all they do or try to do comes right. All that falls to them is so much gain. All their geese are swans. All their cards are trumps. Toss them which way you will. They will always, like poor puss, alight upon their legs, and only move on so much the faster. The world may very likely not always think of them as they think of themselves. But what care they for the world? What can it know about the matter? One of these lucky beings was neighbor Hans. Seven long years he had worked hard for his master. At last he said, Master, my time is up. I must go home and see my poor mother once more, so pray pay me my wages and let me go. And the master said, You have been a faithful and good servant, Hans, so your pay shall be handsome. Then he gave him a lump of silver as big as his head. Hans took out his pocket handkerchief, put the piece of silver into it, threw it over his shoulder, and jogged off on his road homewards. As he went lazily on, Dragging one foot after another, a man came in sight, trotting gaily along on a capital horse. Ah, said Hans aloud, what a fine thing it is to ride on horseback. There he sits as easy and happy as if he was at home, in the chair by his fireside. He trips against no stones, saves shoe leather, and gets on he hardly knows how. Hans did not speak so softly but the horseman heard it all, and said, Well, friend, why do you go on foot then? Ah, said he, I have this load to carry, to be sure it is silver, but it is so heavy that I can't hold up my head, 
and you must know it hurts my shoulder sadly. What do you say of making an exchange, said the horseman? I will give you my horse, and you shall give me the silver, which will save you a great deal of trouble in carrying such a heavy load about with you. With all my heart, said Hans, but as you are so kind to me, I must tell you one thing, you will have a weary task to draw that silver about with you. However, the horseman got off, took the silver, helped Hans up, gave him the bridle into one hand and the whip into the other, and said, When you want to go very fast, smack your lips loudly together, and cry, Jip! Hans was delighted as he sat on the horse, drew himself up, squared his elbows, turned out his toes, cracked his whip, and rode merrily off, one minute whistling a merry tune, and another singing, No care and no sorrow, a fig for the morrow. We'll laugh and be merry, sing nay down dairy. After a time he thought he should like to go a little faster, so he smacked his lips and cried jip. Away went the horse full gallop, and before Hans knew what he was about, he was thrown off, and lay on his back by the roadside. His horse would have ran off, if a shepherd who was coming by, driving a cow, had not stopped it. Hans soon came to himself, and got upon his legs again, sadly vexed, and said to the shepherd, This riding is no joke, when a man has the luck to get upon a beast like this that stumbles and flings him off as if it would break his neck. However, I'm off now once for all. I like your cow now a great deal better than this smart beast that played me this trick, and has spoiled my best coat, you see, in this puddle, which, by the by, smells not very like a nosegay. One can walk along at one's leisure behind that cow, keep good company, and have milk, butter, and cheese every day into the bargain. What would I give to have such a prize? Well, said the shepherd, if you are so fond of her, I will change my cow for your horse. I like to do good to my neighbors, even though I lose by it myself. Done, said Hans, merrily. What a noble heart that good man has, thought he. Then the shepherd jumped upon the horse, wished Hans and the cow good morning, and away he rode. Hans brushed his coat, wiped his face and hands, rested a while, and then drove off his cow quietly, and thought his bargain a very lucky one. If I have only a piece of bread, and I certainly shall always be able to get that, I can, whenever I like, eat my butter and cheese with it, and when I am thirsty I can milk my cow and drink the milk, and what can I wish for more? When he came to an inn, he halted, ate up all his bread, and gave away his last penny for a glass of beer. When he had rested himself he set off again, driving his cow towards his mother's village. But the heat grew greater as soon as noon came on, till at last, as he found himself on a wide heath that would take him more than an hour to cross, he began to be so hot and parched that his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth. I can find a cure for this, thought he. Now I will milk my cow and quench my thirst. So he tied her to the stump of a tree and held his leathern cap to milk into, but not a drop was to be had. Who would have thought that this cow, which was to bring him milk and butter and cheese, was all that time utterly dry? Hans had not thought of looking to that. While he was trying his luck in milking, and managing the matter very clumsily, the uneasy beast began to think him very troublesome, and at last gave him such a kick on the head as knocked him down, and there he lay a long while senseless. Luckily a butcher soon came by, driving a pig in a wheelbarrow. What is the matter with you, my man, said the butcher, as he helped him up. Hans told him what had happened, how he was dry, and wanted to milk his cow, but found the cow was dry too. Then the butcher gave him a flask of ale, saying, There, drink and refresh yourself, your cow will give you no milk. Don't you see she is an old beast, good for nothing but the slaughterhouse? Alas, alas, said Hans, who would have thought it? What a shame to take my horse, and give me only a dry cow. If I kill her, what will she be good for? I hate cow beef, it is not tender enough for me. If it were a pig now, like that fat gentleman you are driving along at his ease, one could do something with it, it would at any rate make sausages. Well, said the butcher, I don't like to say no, when one is asked to do a kind, neighborly thing. To please you I will change, and give you my fine fat pig for the cow. 
Heaven reward you for your kindness and self-denial, said Hans, as he gave the butcher the cow, and taking the pig off the wheelbarrow, drove it away, holding it by the string that was tied to its leg. So on he jogged, and all seemed now to go right with him. He had met with some misfortunes, to be sure, but he was now well repaid for all. How could it be otherwise with such a traveling companion as he had at last got? The next man he met was a countryman carrying a fine white goose. The countryman stopped to ask what was a clock. This led to further chat, and Hans told him all his luck, how he had so many good bargains, and how all the world went gay and smiling with him. The countryman then began to tell his tale, and said he was going to take the goose to a christening. Feel, said he, how heavy it is, and yet it is only eight weeks old. Whoever roasts and eats it will find plenty of fat upon it. It has lived so well. You're right, said Hans, as he weighed it in his hand. But if you talk of fat, my pig is no trifle. Meantime the countryman began to look grave, and shook his head. Hark ye, said he, my worthy friend, you seem a good sort of fellow, so I can't help doing you a kind turn. Your pig may get you into a scrape. In the village I just came from, the squire has had a pig stolen out of his sty. I was dreadfully afraid when I saw you that you had got the squire's pig. If you have, and they catch you, it will be a bad job for you. The least they will do will be to throw you into the horse pond. Can you swim? Poor Hans was sadly frightened. Good man, cried he, pray get me out of this scrape. I know nothing of where the pig was either bred or born, but he may have been the squire's for aught I can tell. You know this country better than I do. Take my pig and give me the goose. I ought to have something into the bargain, said the countryman. Give a fat goose for a pig, indeed. Tis not everyone would do so much for you as that. However, I will not be hard upon you, as you are in trouble. Then he took the string in his hand, and drove off the pig by a side path, while Hans went on the way homewards free from care. After all, thought he, that chap is pretty well taken in. I don't care whose pig it is, but wherever it came from it has been a very good friend to me. I have much the best of the bargain. First there will be a capital roast, then the fat will find me in goose grease for six months, and then there are all the beautiful white feathers. I will put them into my pillow, and then I am sure I shall sleep soundly without rocking. How happy my mother will be! Talk of a pig, indeed! Give me a fine fat goose. As he came to the next village, he saw a scissor grinder with his wheel, working and singing, O'er hill and o'er dale, so happy I roam, work light and live well, all the world is my home, then who's so blithe, so merry as I? Hans stood looking on for a while, and at last said, You must be well off, Master Grinder. You seem so happy at your work. Yes, said the other, mine is a golden trade. A good grinder never puts his hand into his pocket without finding money in it. But where did you get that beautiful goose? I did not buy it. I gave a pig for it. And where did you get the pig? I gave a cow for it. And the cow? I gave a horse for it. And the horse? I gave a lump of silver as big as my head for it. And the silver? Oh, I worked hard for that seven long years. You have thriven well in the world hitherto, said the grinder. Now if you could find money in your pocket whenever you put your hand in it, your fortune would be made. Very true. But how is that to be managed? How? Why, you must turn grinder like myself, said the other. You only want a grindstone. The rest will come of itself. Here is one that is but little the worse for wear. I would not ask more than the value of your goose for it. Will you buy? How can you ask? said Hans. I should be the happiest man in the world. If I could have money whenever I put my hand in my pocket, what could I want more? There's the goose. Now, said the grinder, as he gave him a common rough stone that lay by his side, this is a most capital stone. Do but work it well enough, and you can make an old nail cut with it. Hans took the stone, and went his way with a light heart. His eyes sparkled for joy, and he said to himself, Surely I must have been born in a lucky hour. Everything I could want or wish for comes of itself. People are so kind, they seem really to think I do them a favor in letting them make me rich, and giving me good bargains. Meantime he began to be tired, and hungry too, 
for he had given away his last penny in his joy at getting the cow. At last he could go no farther, for the stone tired him sadly, and he dragged himself to the side of a river, that he might take a drink of water and rest a while. So he laid the stone carefully by his side on the bank, but, as he stooped down to drink, he forgot it, pushed it a little, and down it rolled, plump into the stream. For a while he watched it sinking in the deep clear water, then sprang up and danced for joy, and again fell upon his knees and thanked heaven, with tears in his eyes, for its kindness in taking away his only plague, the ugly heavy stone. How happy am I, cried he, nobody was ever so lucky as I. Then up he got with a light heart, free from all his troubles, and walked until he reached his mother's house, and told her how very easy the road to good luck was. Jorinda and Jorindel There was once an old castle, that stood in the middle of a deep gloomy wood, and in the castle lived an old fairy. Now this fairy could take any shape she pleased. All the day long she flew about in the form of an owl, or crept about the country like a cat but at night she always became an old woman again. When any young man came within a hundred paces of her castle, he became quite fixed, and could not move a step till she came and set him free, which she would not do till he had given her his word never to come there again. But when any pretty maiden came within that space she was changed into a bird, and the fairy put her into a cage, and hung her up in a chamber in the castle. There were seven hundred of these cages hanging in the castle, and all with beautiful birds in them. Now there was once a maiden whose name was Jorinda. She was prettier than all the pretty girls that ever were seen before, and a shepherd lad, whose name was Jorindel, was very fond of her, and they were soon to be married. One day they went to walk in the wood, that they might be alone, and Jorindel said, We must take care that we don't go too near to the fairy's castle. It was a beautiful evening. The last rays of the setting sun shone bright through the long stems of the trees upon the green underwood beneath, and the turtle doves sang from the tall birches. Jorinda sat down to gaze upon the sun, Jorinda sat by her side, and both felt sad they knew not why, but it seemed as if they were to be parted from one another forever. They had wandered a long way, and when they looked to see which way they should go home, they found themselves at a loss to know what path to take. The sun was setting fast, and already half of its circle had sunk behind the hill. Jorindel on a sudden looked behind him, and saw through the bushes that they had, without knowing it, sat down close under the old walls of the castle. Then he shrank for fear, turned pale, and trembled. Jorinda was just singing, the ringdove sang from the willow spray, well a day, well a day. He mourned for the fate of his darling mate, well a day, when her song stopped suddenly. Jorindel turned to see the reason, and beheld his Jorinda changed into a nightingale, so that her song ended with a mournful jug, jug. An owl with fiery eyes flew three times round them, and three times screamed, Too woo! Too woo! Too woo! Jorindel could not move, he stood fixed as a stone, and could neither weep, nor speak, nor stir hand or foot. And now the sun went quite down. The gloomy night came, the owl flew into a bush, and a moment after the old fairy came forth pale and meager, with staring eyes, and a nose and chin that almost met one another. She mumbled something to herself, seized the nightingale, and went away with it in her hand. Poor Jorindel saw the nightingale was gone, but what could he do? He could not speak, he could not move from the spot where he stood. At last the fairy came back and sang with a hoarse voice. Till the prisoner is fast, and her doom is cast, there stay. Oh, stay. When the charm is around her, and the spell has bound her, hie away. Away. On a sudden Jorindel found himself free. Then he fell on his knees before the fairy, and prayed her to give him back his dear Jorinda. But she laughed at him, and said he should never see her again. Then she went her way. He prayed, he wept, he sorrowed but all in vain. Alas, he said, what will become of me? He could not go back to his own home, so he went to a strange village, and employed himself in keeping sheep. Many a time did he walk round and round as near to the hated castle as he dared go, but all in vain, he heard or saw nothing of Jorinda. 
At last he dreamt one night that he found a beautiful purple flower, and that in the middle of it lay a costly pearl, and he dreamt that he plucked the flower, and went with it in his hand into the castle, and that everything he touched with it was disenchanted, and that there he found his Jorinda again. In the morning when he awoke, he began to search over hill and dale for this pretty flower, and eight long days he sought for it in vain. But on the ninth day, early in the morning, he found the beautiful purple flower, and in the middle of it was a large dewdrop, as big as a costly pearl. Then he plucked the flower, and set out and traveled day and night, till he came again to the castle. He walked nearer than a hundred paces to it, and yet he did not become fixed as before, but found that he could go quite close up to the door. Jorindel was very glad indeed to see this. Then he touched the door with the flower, and it sprang open, so that he went in through the court, and listened when he heard so many birds singing. At last he came to the chamber where the fairy sat, with the seven hundred birds singing in the seven hundred cages. When she saw Jorindel she was very angry, and screamed with rage, but she could not come within two yards of him, for the flower he held in his hand was his safeguard. He looked around at the birds, but alas! There were many, many nightingales, and how then should he find out which was his Jorinda? While he was thinking what to do, he saw the fairy had taken down one of the cages, and was making the best of her way off through the door. He ran or flew after her, touched the cage with the flower, and Jorinda stood before him, and threw her arms round his neck looking as beautiful as ever, as beautiful as when they walked together in the wood. Then he touched all the other birds with the flower, so that they all took their old forms again, and he took Jorinda home, where they were married, and lived happily together many years, and so did a good many other lads, whose maidens had been forced to sing in the old fairies' cages by themselves, much longer than they liked. The Traveling Musicians An honest farmer had once an ass that had been a faithful servant to him a great many years, but was now growing old, and every day more and more unfit for work. His master therefore was tired of keeping him and began to think of putting an end to him. But the ass, who saw that some mischief was in the wind, took himself slyly off, and began his journey towards the great city, for there, thought he, I may turn musician. After he had traveled a little way, he spied a dog lying by the roadside and panting as if he were tired. What makes you pant so, my friend, said the ass? Alas, said the dog, my master was going to knock me on the head, because I am old and weak, and can no longer make myself useful to him in hunting, so I ran away, but what can I do to earn my livelihood? Hark ye, said the ass, I am going to the great city to turn musician, suppose you go with me, and try what you can do in the same way? The dog said he was willing, and they jogged on together. They had not gone far before they saw a cat sitting in the middle of the road and making a most rueful face. Pray, my good lady, said the ass, what's the matter with you? You look quite out of spirits. Ah, me, said the cat, how can one be in good spirits when one's life is in danger? Because I am beginning to grow old, and had rather lie at my ease by the fire than run about the house after the mice. My mistress laid hold of me, and was going to drown me, and though I have been lucky enough to get away from her, I do not know what I am to live upon. Oh, said the ass, by all means go with us to the great city. You are a good night singer, and may make your fortune as a musician. The cat was pleased with the thought, and joined the party. Soon afterwards, as they were passing by a farmyard, they saw a cock perched upon a gate, and screaming out with all his might and main. Bravo, said the ass, upon my word, you make a famous noise. Pray what is all this about? Why, said the cock, I was just now saying that we should have fine weather for our washing day, and yet my mistress and the cook don't thank me for my pains, but threaten to cut off my head tomorrow, and make broth of me for the guests that are coming on Sunday. Heaven forbid, said the ass, come with us, Master Chanticleer. It will be better, at any rate, than staying here to have your head cut off. Besides, who knows? If we care to sing in tune, we may get up some kind of a concert so come along with us. With all my heart, said the cock, so they all four went on jollily together. They could not, however, reach the great city the first day, so when night came on, they went into a wood to sleep. 
The ass and the dog laid themselves down under a great tree, and the cat climbed up into the branches, while the cock, thinking that the higher he sat the safer he should be, flew up to the very top of the tree, and then, according to his custom, before he went to sleep, looked out on all sides of him to see that everything was well. In doing this, he saw afar off something bright and shining and calling to his companions said, There must be a house no great way off, for I see a light. If that be the case, said the ass, we had better change our quarters, for our lodging is not the best in the world. Besides, added the dog, I should not be the worse for a bone or two, or a bit of meat. So they walked off together towards the spot where Chanticleer had seen the light, and as they drew near it became larger and brighter, till they at last came close to a house in which a gang of robbers lived. The ass, being the tallest of the company, marched up to the window and peeped in. Well, donkey, said Chanticleer, what do you see? What do I see? replied the ass. Why, I see a table spread with all kinds of good things, and robbers sitting round and making merry. That would be a noble lodging for us, said the cock. Yes, said the ass, if we could only get in. So they consulted together how they should contrive to get the robbers out, and at last they hit upon a plan. The ass placed himself upright on his hind legs, with his four feet resting against the window. The dog got upon his back. The cat scrambled up to the dog's shoulders, and the cock flew up and sat upon the cat's head. When all was ready a signal was given, and they began their music. The ass brayed, the dog barked, the cat mewed, and the cock screamed, and then they all broke through the window at once, and came tumbling into the room, amongst the broken glass, with a most hideous clatter. The robbers, who had been not a little frightened by the opening concert, had now no doubt that some frightful hobgoblin had broken in upon them, and scampered away as fast as they could. The coast once clear, our travelers soon sat down and dispatched what the robbers had left with as much eagerness as if they had not expected to eat again for a month. As soon as they had satisfied themselves, they put out the lights, and each once more sought out a resting place to his own liking. The donkey laid himself down upon a heap of straw in the yard, the dog stretched himself upon a mat behind the door, the cat rolled herself up on the hearth before the warm ashes, and the cock perched upon a beam on the top of the house, and, as they were all rather tired with their journey, they soon fell asleep. But about midnight, when the robbers saw from afar that the lights were out and that all seemed quiet, they began to think that they had been in too great a hurry to run away, and one of them, who was bolder than the rest, went to see what was going on. Finding everything still, he marched into the kitchen and groped about till he found a match in order to light a candle, and then, espying the glittering fiery eyes of the cat, he mistook them for live coals, and held the match to them to light it. But the cat, not understanding this joke, sprang at his face, and spat, and scratched at him. This frightened him dreadfully, and away he ran to the back door. But there the dog jumped up and bit him in the leg, and as he was crossing over the yard the ass kicked him, and the cock, who had been awakened by the noise, crowed with all his might. At this the robber ran back as fast as he could to his comrades, and told the captain how a horrid witch had got into the house, and had spat at him and scratched his face with her long bony fingers, how a man with a knife in his hand had hidden himself behind the door, and stabbed him in the leg, how a black monster stood in the yard and struck him with a club, and how the devil had sat upon the top of the house and cried out, Throw the rascal up here. After this the robbers never dared to go back to the house. But the musicians were so pleased with their quarters that they took up their abode there, and there they are, I dare say, at this very day. Old Sultan A shepherd had a faithful dog called Sultan, who was grown very old, and had lost all his teeth. And one day when the shepherd and his wife were standing together before the house the shepherd said, I will shoot old Sultan tomorrow morning, for he is of no use now. But his wife said, Pray let the poor faithful creature live. He has served us well a great many years, and we ought to give him a livelihood for the rest of his days. But what can we do with him? said the shepherd. He has not a tooth in his head, and the thieves don't care for him at all. To be sure he has served us, but then he did it to earn his livelihood. Tomorrow shall be his last day, depend upon it. 
first sultan, who was lying close by them, heard all that the shepherd and his wife said to one another, and was very much frightened to think tomorrow would be his last day. So in the evening he went to his good friend the wolf, who lived in the wood, and told him all his sorrows, and how his master meant to kill him in the morning. Make yourself easy, said the wolf, I will give you some good advice. Your master, you know, goes out every morning very early with his wife into the field, and they take their little child with them, and lay it down behind the hedge in the shade while they are at work. Now do you lie down close by the child, and pretend to be watching it, and I will come out of the wood and run away with it. You must run after me as fast as you can, and I will let it drop. Then you may carry it back, and they will think you have saved their child, and will be so thankful to you that they will take care of you as long as you live. The dog liked this plan very well, and accordingly so it was managed. The wolf ran with the child a little way. The shepherd and his wife screamed out, but Sultan soon overtook him and carried the poor little thing back to his master and mistress. Then the shepherd patted him on the head and said, Old Sultan has saved our child from the wolf, and therefore he shall live and be well taken care of and have plenty to eat. Wife, go home and give him a good dinner and let him have my old cushion to sleep on as long as he lives. So from this time forward Sultan had all that he could wish for. Soon afterwards the wolf came and wished him joy, and said, Now, my good fellow, you must tell no tales, but turn your head the other way when I want to taste one of the old shepherd's fine fat sheep. No, said the Sultan, I will be true to my master. However, the wolf thought he was in joke, and came one night to get a dainty morsel. But Sultan had told his master what the wolf meant to do. So he laid wait for him behind the barn door, and when the wolf was busy looking out for a good fat sheep, he had a stout cudgel laid about his back, that combed his locks for him finely. Then the wolf was very angry, and called Sultan an old rogue, and swore he would have his revenge. So the next morning the wolf sent the boar to challenge Sultan to come into the wood to fight the matter. Now Sultan had nobody he could ask to be his second but the shepherd's old three-legged cat, so he took her with him and as the poor thing limped along with some trouble, she stuck up her tail straight in the air. The wolf and the wild boar were first on the ground, and when they espied their enemies coming, and saw the cat's long tail standing straight in the air, they thought she was carrying a sword for Sultan to fight with, and every time she limped, they thought she was picking up a stone to throw at them, so they said they should not like this way of fighting, and the boar lay down behind a bush and the wolf jumped up into a tree. Sultan and the cat soon came up, and looked about and wondered that no one was there. The boar, however, had not quite hidden himself, for his ears stuck out of the bush, and when he shook one of them a little, the cat, seeing something move, and thinking it was a mouse, sprang upon it, and bit and scratched it, so that the boar jumped up and grunted, and ran away, roaring out, Look up in the tree, there sits the one who is to blame. So they looked up, and espied the wolf sitting amongst the branches, and they called him a cowardly rascal, and would not suffer him to come down till he was heartily ashamed of himself, and had promised to be good friends again with old Sultan. The Straw, the Coal, and the Bean In a village dwelt a poor old woman, who had gathered together a dish of beans and wanted to cook them. So she made a fire on her hearth, and that it might burn the quicker, she lighted it with a handful of straw. When she was emptying the beans into the pan, one dropped without her observing it, and lay on the ground beside a straw, and soon afterwards a burning coal from the fire leapt down to the two. Then the straw began and said, Dear friends, from whence do you come here? The coal replied, I fortunately sprang out of the fire, and if I had not escaped by sheer force, my death would have been certain, I should have been burnt to ashes. The bean said, I too have escaped with a whole skin. But if the old woman had got me into the pan, I should have been made into broth without any mercy, like my comrades. And would a better fate have fallen to my lot, said the straw. The old woman has destroyed all my brethren in fire and smoke. She seized sixty of them at once, and took their lives. I luckily slipped through her fingers. But what are we to do now, said the coal? I think, answered the bean, that as we have so fortunately escaped death, we should keep together like good companions, 
and lest the new mischance should overtake us here, we should go away together, and repair to a foreign country. The proposition pleased the two others, and they set out on their way together. Soon, however, they came to a little brook, and as there was no bridge or footplank, they did not know how they were to get over it. The straw hit on a good idea, and said I will lay myself straight across, and then you can walk over on me as on a bridge. The straw therefore stretched itself from one bank to the other, and the coal, who was of an impetuous disposition, tripped quite boldly on to the newly built bridge. But when she had reached the middle, and heard the water rushing beneath her, she was after all, afraid, and stood still, and ventured no farther. The straw, however, began to burn, broke in two pieces, and fell into the stream. The coal slipped after her, hissed when she got into the water, and breathed her last. The bean, who had prudently stayed behind on the shore, could not but laugh at the event, was unable to stop, and laughed so heartily that she burst. It would have been all over with her, likewise, if, by good fortune, a tailor who was traveling in search of work had not sat down to rest by the brook. As he had a compassionate heart he pulled out his needle and thread, and sewed her together. The bean thanked him most prettily, but as the tailor used black thread, all beans since then have a black seam. Briar Rose A king and queen once upon a time reigned in a country a great way off, where there were in those days fairies. Now this king and queen had plenty of money, and plenty of fine clothes to wear, and plenty of good things to eat and drink, and a coach to ride out in every day. But though they had been married many years they had no children, and this grieved them very much indeed. But one day as the queen was walking by the side of the river, at the bottom of the garden, she saw a poor little fish that had thrown itself out of the water, and lay gasping and nearly dead on the bank. Then the queen took pity on the little fish, and threw it back again into the river, and before it swam away it lifted its head out of the water and said, I know what your wish is, and it shall be fulfilled, in return for your kindness to me, you will soon have a daughter. What the little fish had foretold soon came to pass, and the queen had a little girl, so very beautiful that the king could not cease looking on it for joy, and said he would hold a great feast and make merry, and show the child to all the land. So he asked his kinsmen, and nobles, and friends, and neighbors. But the queen said, I will have the fairies also, that they might be kind and good to our little daughter. Now there were thirteen fairies in the kingdom, but as the king and queen had only twelve golden dishes for them to eat out of, they were forced to leave one of the fairies without asking her. So twelve fairies came, each with a high red cap on her head, and red shoes with high heels on her feet, and a long white wand in her hand, and after the feast was over they gathered round in a ring and gave all their best gifts to the little princess. One gave her goodness, another beauty, another riches, and so until she had all that was good in the world. Just as eleven of them had done blessing her, a great noise was heard in the courtyard, and word was brought that the thirteenth fairy was come, with a black cap on her head, and black shoes on her feet, and a broomstick in her hand, and presently up she came into the dining hall. Now, as she had not been asked to the feast she was very angry and scolded the king and queen very much, and set to work to take her revenge. So she cried out, The king's daughter shall, in her fifteenth year, be wounded by a spindle, and fall down dead. Then the twelfth of the friendly fairies, who had not yet given her gift, came forward, and said that the evil wish must be fulfilled, but that she could soften its mischief. So her gift was, that the king's daughter, when the spindle wounded her, should not really die, but should only fall asleep for a hundred years. However, the king hoped still to save his dear child altogether from the threatened evil, so he ordered that all the spindles in the kingdom should be bought up and burnt. But all the gifts of the first eleven fairies were in the meantime fulfilled, for the princess was so beautiful, and well-behaved, and good, and wise, that everyone who knew her loved her. It happened that, on the very day she was fifteen years old, the king and queen were not at home, and she was left alone in the palace. So she roved about by herself, and looked at all the rooms and chambers, till at last she came to an old tower, to which there was a narrow staircase ending with a little door. In the door there was a golden key, and when she turned it the door sprang open, 
and there sat an old lady spinning away very busily. Why, how now, good mother, said the princess, what are you doing there? Spinning, said the old lady, and nodded her head, humming a tune, while buzz, went the wheel. How prettily that little thing turns round, said the princess, and took the spindle and began to try and spin. But scarcely had she touched it, before the fairy's prophecy was fulfilled. The spindle wounded her, and she fell down lifeless on the ground. However, she was not dead, but had only fallen into a deep sleep, and the king and the queen, who had just come home, and all their court, fell asleep too, and the horses slept in the stables, and the dogs in the court, the pigeons on the housetop, and the very flies slept upon the walls. Even the fire on the hearth left off blazing, and went to sleep. The jack stopped, and the spit that was turning about with a goose upon it for the king's dinner stood still, and the cook, who was at that moment pulling the kitchen boy by the hair to give him a box on the ear for something he had done amiss, let him go, and both fell asleep. The butler, who was slyly tasting the ale, fell asleep with the jug at his lips, and thus everything stood still, and slept soundly. A large hedge of thorns soon grew round the palace, and every year it became higher and thicker, till at last the old palace was surrounded and hidden, so that not even the roof or the chimneys could be seen. But there went a report through all the land of the beautiful sleeping Briar Rose, for so the king's daughter was called so that, from time to time, several king's sons came and tried to break through the thicket into the palace. This, however, none of them could ever do, for the thorns and bushes laid hold of them, as it were with hands, and there they stuck fast and died wretchedly. After many, many years there came a king's son into that land, and an old man told him the story of the thicket of thorns, and how a beautiful palace stood behind it, and how a wonderful princess, called Briar Rose, lay in it asleep, with all her court. He told, too, how he had heard from his grandfather that many, many princes had come, and had tried to break through the thicket, but that they had all stuck fast in it, and died. Then the young prince said, All this shall not frighten me. I will go and see this Briar Rose. The old man tried to hinder him, but he was bent upon going. Now that very day the hundred years were ended, and as the prince came to the thicket he saw nothing but beautiful flowering shrubs, through which he went with ease, and they shut in after him as thick as ever. Then he came at last to the palace, and there in the court lay the dogs asleep, and the horses were standing in the stables, and on the roof sat the pigeons fast asleep, with their heads under their wings. And when he came into the palace, the flies were sleeping on the walls, the spit was standing still, the butler had the jug of ale at his lips, going to drink a draught. The maid sat with a fowl in her lap ready to be plucked, and the cook in the kitchen was still holding up her hand, as if she was going to beat the boy. Then he went on still farther, and all was so still that he could hear every breath he drew, till at last he came to the old tower, and opened the door of the little room in which Briar Rose was, and there she lay, fast asleep on a couch by the window. She looked so beautiful that he could not take his eyes off her, so he stooped down and gave her a kiss. But the moment he kissed her she opened her eyes and awoke, and smiled upon him, and they went out together, and soon the king and queen also awoke, and all the court, and gazed on each other with great wonder. And the horses shook themselves, and the dogs jumped up and barked. The pigeons took their heads from under their wings, and looked about and flew into the fields. The flies on the walls buzzed again, the fire in the kitchen blazed up, round went the jack, and round went the spit with the goose for the king's dinner upon it. The butler finished his draught of ale, the maid went on plucking the fowl, and the cook gave the boy the box on his ear. And then the prince and Briar Rose were married, and the wedding feast was given, and they lived happily together all their lives long. And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of this incredible story together, but the adventure doesn't stop here. We have a variety of story videos like this one available for your enjoyment. To watch more, just click here. If you've enjoyed this story and want more mind-blowing stories, be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our next epic upload. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.